Interestingly, that idea is something which captured the imaginations of many 19th century commentators. You read Engels on the condition of the working class, and one of the things he talks about is his surprise at the kind of urban personality he confronts when he comes to London. What kind of urban personality is emerging in Manchester? Uh, if you go to some of the great 19th century novelists, Balzac being one of my favorites, uh, it's all about the human personality, which is consistent with the personality of Paris as an emerging city. If you go to Zimmel's famous essay on the metropolis of mental life, you'll see again an incredible fascination with this question of how urbanization is changing the human personality. And if you read Freud or somebody like that, you find that Freud is keenly aware that the kind of analysis he's doing is a very urban, urban uh, conditioned situation. That urban traumas, accidents, traumas of urban life are playing a very important role in consciousness formation. Now this, I, this was very strong in the 19th century, but we seem to have lost a lot of stomach for it for certain kinds of reasons. But I think it's still important to do, and I want to sketch in a little bit how to think about that through the uneven geographical development of urbanization. Now, at this point, it seems to be important to say, well, let's look a little bit about what cities are about. And the one thing that you find historically, which is right from the get-go, is that cities have always been about the production, mobilization, and both the social and geographical concentration of a surplus product. And there's always an interesting question. Whenever you see a city from whenever, you ask yourself the question, where did the surplus product come from to produce this? And then you ask yourself the question, what did the people do with the surplus product when they got it? And the fact is that, yeah, they sometimes built places like the Alhambra, or they built places like Florence and so on. But you sit there and you say, whose surpluses were being extracted? And how were they being extracted? So the collect connectivity between urbanization and the mobilization and concentration of a surplus product has always been there, which means that cities have always been a class project of some kind. It could be a theological class, it could be a military caste or something, but they've always been uh, the product of, kind of some kind of yeah, elite configuration. So that connectivity between the city and the surplus product is interesting because it connects to capitalism in a very particular way. Because if you ask yourself what capitalism is about, capitalists are always in pursuit of a profit, which in Marx's language says they're always looking for surplus value. How do they get surplus value? Well, the only way they can get surplus value is to produce a surplus product, which means by definition the whole history of capitalism has been about <coughs> producing the conditions which are necessary for urbanization to occur. So that there is therefore a relationship between this dynamic of capitalism, which has been sort of a compound rate of interest, if you like, all the time, and the dynamics of urbanization. And we have to think about that connection. But the thesis I want to pursue here is that actually urbanization has a very specific role to play in the absorption of capitalist surplus product. <laughs> because there is a problem that capitalists have, which is what do they do with the surplus value they produce? This goes back to a very simplistic view of what is it that capitalists do. Simply put, they start out the morning with a certain amount of money. They go into the marketplace and they buy labor power as a commodity. They buy means of production. They set up and buy a particular technological capacity. They set that to work and produce a new commodity. They then sell that commodity for more money than they started out with, i.e. a profit. That's what they do. That's the basic kind of line of argument. And in all of this, they face a number of barriers. <coughs> and the big question is, what do they do on the next morning with the surplus value they got the day before. 
Now, if they were normal people like you and I, they would probably say, well, we're going to have a good time with it. We're going to consume it. And I suspect that they, they long to do that. But as Marx points out, there's one thing that stops them, which is that capitalism is organized as a competitive system. And as a competitive system, capitalists are subject to something called the coercive laws of competition. And the coercive laws of competition basically dictate that if you don't reinvest some of the surplus value you got yesterday in the expansion of your activity tomorrow, then you ain't going to remain a capitalist very long. In other words, there's a competitive imperative to reinvest in expansion. Which means you need more labor power, you need more means of production, which puts pressure on labor markets, puts pressure on the relation to nature. You need new technologies, you need new products, and you need new markets, and all this kind of stuff. And this goes on forever and ever, unless you cannot expand, in which case your capital is worthless. And you get a crisis, a crisis of devaluation, the writing down of assets. We talked about this five years ago. People would understand what you meant. Now I think everybody understands what you mean. The writing down of the value of assets, uh, a collapse of valuation schemas and all the rest of it. So you run into a capitalist crisis. And periodically, capitalism has run into crisis of a serious sort. Uh, and that crisis has led to the question, how are we going to revive a capitalist economy? And there are various strategies and means and ways which have been discovered historically. And the one I'm particularly interested in articulating is the role of urbanization in actually reviving a capitalist economy around the theme that you can absorb your surplus product through an urbanization project of a certain kind. Now, the first place that I really found this sort of so clear was when I was doing my work on 19th century Paris, and in particular, Second Empire Paris. 1848 was a classic crisis of capitalism. Unemployed capital. They couldn't figure out where to invest their surplus product. Where were they going to put it? Unemployed capital meant unemployed laborers. And at that time in Paris, unemployed laborers were distinctly interested in creating a different kind of society. They were interested and they were inspired by lots of utopian schemes and utopian thinking of the 1830s and 1840s. So they made a revolution in 1848. So we're going to have a different kind of world, a non-bourgeois world. We're going to take away all those property rights and we're going to socialize everything. Uh, that scared the bourgeoisie. So the bourgeoisie organized a counter-revolution and killed off the workers' revolution. But then was faced with the problem, how on earth are they going to get capital and labor back to work? And the bourgeoisie couldn't figure out how to do it. So what happened was into that political and economic vacuum, they wrote the figure of Louis Bonaparte. And what Louis Bonaparte did was to say, well, OK, uh, elect me, and I'll help you out. He then staged a coup, and then he declared empire and declared himself an emperor. But what Louis Bonaparte knew very well was he wasn't going to survive very long without actually reviving capitalist development. And what was he going to do? So when he declared empire, he said, we're going to do this by a vast program of public works throughout France and actually throughout the whole of the capitalist world. So he was in support of things like the Suez Canal and the building of the railroad through most of Europe and so on. So he, he set that in motion. But chief of all, he said, we're going to re-engineer Paris. And for that reason, he brought Haussmann to Paris and said, re-engineer Paris. And absorb the capital and the labor in a vast project. And so that's what Haussmann effectively did. And in so doing, however, he had to rethink what the nature of urbanization was about. Because there were many utopian plans for re-engineering of Paris in the 1830s and 1840s. And there were lots of ideas, and he drew upon a lot of those ideas from actually utopian thinkers like Saint-Simon and Fourier and so on. He drew upon those ideas, although he never admitted it. But he did it with a very singular difference. That is, he changed the scale at which he thought of the urban project. 